evening, um, Sue, with you, if that's okay. And then that way, yeah. um, if you, um, you know, have other engagements oh. or whatever after you've, after you've spoken, then you can, um, then you can head off. But um, I know that we're all keen to hear from you. So we might start with you this evening. Um, have you, you, I'm assuming you've um, met with Peter and um, arranged, you know, what you're going to do. Do you need your screen shared? Do you, are you get a presentation or? Uh, yes, anything? I have. Do I just click the share screen button for you? I think so, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I shall do that. Um, can you see it now? Mm. Takes a while. Yeah, it does take a, a bit. Oh, here we go. Yes, we have it. I have it. You have it? Great. Excellent. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present to the Rotary E Club of Melbourne. Um, it's really great to be able to be here and um, I hope you enjoy a little excerpt from the book, um, 120 Ways to Achieve Your Purpose with LinkedIn, which is uh, what I've actually uh, written as a result of working on LinkedIn for uh, quite a long time now. I, I joined on the 21st of December 2003 and I started consulting on you know, 2008 and now this book has been written and that's 80,000 words with, with lots of stuff about LinkedIn in it. So, um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun putting a book together, let me tell you. Anybody else in the group written a book? No. No. no I don't <laughs> I read many books either. So <laughs> before... Before you go on, do you mind if I record this um, your this yeah, presentation? Yeah, absolutely fine. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, yeah, again, um, I'm just going to give you 20 ways to achieve your purpose with LinkedIn. Um, Jack and Peter have been doing a little bit of work in the background and making sure that we've got the Rotary E-Club of Melbourne with a company profile on LinkedIn. So we'll go through that. But really would love to be able to answer your questions. I'll try and make it as interactive as possible. But I thought what I'd do, first of all, is just go through a few slides and just give you a little bit of a background for those of you who don't know much about LinkedIn. Um, one of the most recent statistics suggests that they've got about 433 million members across the world and that has increased by about, I think it's 10 members per second are joining LinkedIn. So uh, after starting in 2003, that's, that's an awful lot of people around the world. It's about 8 million members in Australia and two of the most uh, significant groups that are increasing are people in regional Australia and students in secondary and, and tertiary education. So when they first started off, they were a network for professionals and they've acquired a number of other services like Pulse, which is a newsfeed service, SlideShare, which is where you can put your PowerPoint presentations, lynda.com, which is online training. So they're much more into publishing now, but their third incarnation is going to be a business-to-business -business platform. So you'll see other things happening. They've recently acquired Connectifier, which is a service that usually works with your internet browser. So when you've got Google Chrome turned on, if you Google Sue Elson and you had Connectifier there, you would be able to see all my profiles at once. So if you're a recruiter, you wouldn't just have the LinkedIn profile, you'd actually have an opportunity to see you know, that person's profile wherever they are on the internet. So um, LinkedIn's recently acquired that service as well. So the way I see it, it's not going away anytime soon and um, it's beaten pretty much every other competitor that's come along for quite some time. There's Vagio in um, France, there's Zing, which used to be OpenBC in Germany, but, you know, still LinkedIn seems to be the main network for professionals. Um, compared to other social media platforms in Australia, there's about 14 million Australians on Facebook and about 4 million on Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, and about 3 million on Twitter. So um, in terms of numbers, it does pretty well. About 50% of the people earn more than 100 grand a year as well. So that's an interesting stat. So if you want to use LinkedIn for your own personal, professional purposes, one of the main advantages of LinkedIn is 
the fact that if somebody Googles your name, then LinkedIn is likely to come up. So even after I created my own website, sueelson.com, it was actually still LinkedIn would come up before my own website. Um, it doesn't anymore, but uh, it did do that for at least six months. So if you don't have a website of your own and you are freelancing or consulting or something like that, you can quite often just get away with just having a LinkedIn profile. It also means that if people look at the profile, they can find out more information about you. And so my mobile phone number is all over the internet and I don't get calls from random people because my message is very, very clear. And, um, you know, it's a bit like when you drive past a real estate board, just because you see a mobile phone number, you don't think, oh, well, I better ring someone. Uh, obviously, if you're interested in the property, then you would. But, you know, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with putting my mobile number online. Uh, I think one of the best advantages of LinkedIn is the ability to build your personal network. And I don't believe there is anything like job security in any industry anymore. But what will get you through most of life is your network, people who can refer you on to other opportunities, who know you, who can recommend you. And this way, you know, if you, if you lose your little black book, um, you've still got the cloud-based database and, and people update their records. So I've been doing some work with large organisations that are leaving the country. And for those people who've worked there 10, 20, 30 years, at least if they connect on LinkedIn, they can still stay in touch with the people they've known for a long time. Um, it's also a really great way to do research. So if you guys are looking for extra guest speakers, uh, by all means, check out LinkedIn. I've been very successful at securing speakers for events by doing research on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, that's worked really well for me. And also one of the biggest queries I get is, you know, I get all these requests from people who want to connect with me. Should I do it or not? And my answer to that is, well, it really depends on your purpose. So if you want to build a network, Yes, say yes, you know, after you've checked out their profiles. If you want to specialise in a particular niche and only talk to other people who are in cyber security or something, um, then you would only connect with those people. So it really depends on your, your personal choice. Any questions on, on that slide? Not from me. Not from me. <laughs> okay, nice and easy. So, again, um, from a professional perspective, again, you can optimise your name for referral business and they are suggesting nowadays up to 85% of business is actually conducted by referral. Also, if I hear about you and you're a fantastic accountant, then I can say, all right, well, let's check out what their profile's like, who they've got shared connections with, who's recommended them, uh, all that kind of stuff. You can do some due diligence. You can also build your network. So when you go to a networking event, you can connect with people afterwards and sort of keep in touch. And because you're automatically connecting to them <coughs> and doing updates, that will automatically let them know that you're still alive and you exist. And again, you can either invite or decline opportunities. If you're in professional capacity, you may actually try and reach out to a few people and most people prefer it if you personalise the invitation and be specific about why you want to connect. Uh, there is a bit of an etiquette. If you join LinkedIn, connect with someone, the next day say, I want to sell you something, um, you know, people get really angry about that. So I definitely don't recommend that as a strategy. I, I definitely recommend that you build your, your network and, and move forward that way in a, in a you know, much nicer way. So in terms of Rotary's use, I would like to suggest that all of you who've got LinkedIn profiles, click on that link and follow the Rotary eClub of Melbourne because that way you'll be connected to that Rotary eClub of Melbourne page and the updates in your news feed. Are you guys able to click on that link from your screens? Um, no, not... Um. Not through your presentation. Right. Okay. No. Well, just, search, just search for I've it. Got my phone. Yeah. Yes. So you, you can search for it from your phone. Uh, well, sorry, I normally recommend that if you're going to do any searches, you use your desktop version of LinkedIn. It, it works much better than the mobile version on an iPad or on a phone uh, or a tablet. And so if we just type in the search box up the top, Rotary E Club of Melbourne. You can see there that's your company profile. 
and then you just click follow. So it's very easy to do that. So somebody's already done it because there was only three followers when I checked before. Me. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I don't like being called an employee of an e-club. There's, uh, it's, it seems a bit unfortunate that it's, you know, defaulted to, you know, a, a corporate type not-for-profit. Um, yes. well, yeah, it's interesting because I've been involved with the Australian Human Resources Institute for a number of years and I list that role in both the experience <laughs> section as well as in the voluntary section because that particular mm. role is relevant to my professional career. And I think for a lot of people who are involved in Rotary, there's so many transferable skills that you could actually put it in both sections of your LinkedIn profile. Um, I've also been involved in scouts and I've chosen to only include the scouting involvement in my voluntary section because I don't really want to be known as a, a parent helper from scouts, you know, and, and sailing and cooking and other things I've done through that. So, um, but rotary is something that, you know, looks good either in your professional experience or in your voluntary experience. Hmm. Okay. Um, also what you can do is... Uh, as I said, listed in your experience. You can also list it in the organisations that you support and voluntary. And then you can also share updates in your news feed. So, again, um, have there been any updates to the profile yet? No, there's nothing. No, I, I kind of left it to wait till after we'd heard from you. So I, I set it up and then just left it. There's nothing on there. Even the little um, blurb that I've got there is just a very thrown together bit. So... Well, what you could also do in this section here is you could actually type in http colon slash slash rotaryclubofmelbourne.org.au and even though it's only text on the screen, um, it means that people can copy and paste it and obviously put it in their browser in another tab. But also what it means is if the person is looking at this profile on their mobile device, it will be another link, just like this link here is the link. So right. actually include that in the summary in there as well um, just okay. so that might be another little extra thing that you guys can do um, but ultimately what would be great is if you're going to share an update through the rotary e club of melbourne it will appear down the bottom here and what you would do is you'd, you'd let everybody know hi everyone we've just put an update on our rotary e club of melbourne linkedin company page can you please like comment or share it and, and that will give it a bit more interaction through, you know, everybody who's connected. So I'll just show you uh, something that's on, oh no, I won't do mine, I'll do my publishing one. I can type properly with this different keyboard. So this is my company page for 120 Ways Publishing, and I'm obviously the admin, so I've got a few more things. It's only a fairly new company page. The screen is not allowing me to get that across. So, you know, here you can see that I've done an update where I've just mentioned that my book's now in the Albert Park Library. So if I was one of the Rotary Clubs of Melbourne members, I'd check all that out and make sure the link was good. I'd click like, I'd comment on it. And um, if a share button's there, you know, you can always do the sharing as well. And LinkedIn really values posts that are shared. So um, <coughs> we can encourage people to share some. And yeah, there one like there that's probably me. You can add comments and so on. But before you ever do that, folks, always check the links and make sure everything you know, is perfectly uh, normal and so on before you do that. Any questions? Um, no. No? Okay, let's move on. Is the company page uh, free or do you have yes. to pay for that? Yeah, no, it's free, but you do need to have an email address on the company's website. So you can't use your Gmail email address or some other one. You would actually have to be something at rotaryclubofmelbourne.org.au or something like that. Um, Linda, do you have more than one admin person? I, I made um, Caitlin and Caroline admin um, because I or, was already connected to them, so I was able to find them. Um, 
I'm now connected to Saxon, but I haven't gone in to make him admin at this stage. Right, excellent. I always encourage any organisation to have a minimum of two admins because, you know, if one's busy, well, like Jack's out at the moment and not able to update things. So it really is good if you've got, you know, somebody else who can keep an eye on things and, yeah, that, that's really good. Mm. Um, and Belinda, are we using for our email address um, connect at rotaryclubofmelbourne.com.au? Mm, good question. I'm not but sure. I know that we, we, uh, Peter will be there in the background, but um, you know, quite often we, we're directing people to respond to to him to RSVP and things. But I think it would be good going forward to be consistent and use connect at yeah, because, or connect with us at whatever we decided because it um, I don't know this it, that goes to more than one person, doesn't it? Or it just goes to Peter, but at least it's not his personal email address yeah i think i just used um rotary e-club or no e-club of melbourne yeah um, what happens at, when, when you create the company profile you have to have an email address for the rotary club on your personal linkedin profile so yeah. that contact connect with us or something like that at rotary e-club if somebody used that email address, it would only be able to be added to one person's LinkedIn profile. So whilst you could get all your correspondence coming through to that email, and that would be fine, it can only actually be added to one person's personal LinkedIn profile. You can't have the same email address on six different LinkedIn profiles access, yep. you know, that, that account. So that's why it's good. I mean, you only have to have one person with a Rotary Club of Melbourne to create the account, but then individuals through their own profile can then be admins afterwards. So I've, I've, I'm just looking at our, um, just looking at our page at the moment, and I haven't, I, uh, to be honest, I haven't explored company pages at all. So I've set it up, but now I don't know how to find where, how to edit it. Like where, where have I put? <laughs> who is the admin? All that sort of thing. Where do I find that? Okay, so. Um, this is my one up here. I'll just go back to the top of the screen. And you should see there's a blue box there, edit. Have you got that on your screen? Hang on, where am I looking? Uh, no, the edit button isn't there. There's a following, but there's nothing underneath it. Right, well then I'm guessing you might not be the admin then. Did somebody else oh, create it? I created it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let, me see. let me see if I can get into it. Yeah. yeah. Because you can see here I'm the only designated admin. I mean, this is my enterprise. I'm not going to give away access to anybody else. But, yeah. you know, if I wanted to connect, I think I'm connected to Jack. Maybe not. What's your last name again, Peter? Lamping. I oh, don't really connect there either. Anyway, what, what you can do is anybody that you're connected to, you can search for, and I think you'll find that um, they're going to be able to be connected. I'll check with... This is a, one of my past clients. Yeah, so it's as, as quick as that, you know, that you find the person and, and you click and add them. Yeah. All right, and for some reason, just can't edit. <laughs> I can. Oh, you can. <laughs> so maybe I go and see who's you make um... me an admin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I've set it up and not made myself an admin. That's weird. <laughs> Gabe, don't laugh. You're talking <laughs> No, no, you're you're an admin. Oh, okay. So why can't are you logged into LinkedIn? Yeah. You've got your little picture on the top right-hand side of the screen? I do, yes. Oh, hang on. There we go. I've opened it up again and there it is. Edit. Okay. Yeah, good now, now. This, is, this is a really good point that you make. Sometimes when you do something on LinkedIn, it just doesn't appear to work. And if you refresh your screen, all of a sudden it does. And okay. I remember when I first started working on computers, you would tell it to do something and it would absolutely do it. And as the years have gone on, they've added so many bells and whistles. It's amazing and it's terrific. Mm. But quite often, something will go wrong for no apparent reason and you did nothing wrong. 
So, yeah, just don't, don't ever assume that you did something wrong. I actually find that the platform can be unstable. It's also why I recommend that you use Google Chrome as your browser when you're checking out LinkedIn. So are you on Internet Explorer, Safari or Firefox? Yeah, I'm on Safari. Yeah, that could be the reason why. Okay. So, so just be aware of that. All righty, so I'll go back to the slides. Then I'm going to show you some really practical stuff as well for your own LinkedIn uh, profiles. So the next thing is uh, once you start getting familiar with LinkedIn, you could definitely share Rotary eClub of Melbourne updates. You could also write on your own profile a post about your Rotary projects and what you've done through your involvement with Rotary. Um, and as a post, but as well as a project. There's two different sections that you could do that. You could also consider following Rotary International so that you can see the updates that they're hearing. And I encourage you guys to add, if you've got description of all the members of the Rotary eClub of Melbourne on your website, you know, you could put your photo in a LinkedIn uh, link so that people can connect to you and see a little bit more about all the Rotary eClub members by looking at the LinkedIn URL. And I've also got my LinkedIn URL in my email signature. So um, that means people can click on it from there as well. So um, a, be a benefit of attending tonight's little uh, meeting is if you would like to message me either via text message or email, you, I'm happy to send through a copy of the top 20 tips and techniques for your uh, from the book, if you would like that for free. So uh, oh, nice. I'm happy for you if you just want to contact me. And you're also welcome to connect to me uh, because I share updates every so often. I try not to share too many, um, but, you know, usually there's information in most of the links that I share. So uh, you're welcome to connect to me. So, Thank you. All right. So now I'd like to show you some specific things with LinkedIn. And whenever I start working with someone, and if you guys are signed into your LinkedIn account, um, you can check this out at the same time. First of all, when you sign in, you'll be on your home page. And in the middle of your screen, it will say how many views you've had in the last so many days. So if we click on this, you can see that I've had 855 views in the last 90 days. Now, I wouldn't be expecting any of you guys to have that many views. Um, if you're getting probably about 20 views per 90 days, it pretty much means the only people who are looking at are friends, family, and you know maybe work colleagues or something like that. If you were actively looking for work or business, I'd suggest you'd have to be aiming for about 100 views per 90 days there. And then you know, you know that your profile's working for you. Anybody got over 50? <laughs> I've got seven. 43. <laughs> <laughs> All right, plenty of room for improvement then. But I've got the latest one as a recruiter. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good, yeah. And then as you scroll down the page, this is my favourite thing to do on LinkedIn, and I call it reverse stalking. So what it means is I can see who's been looking at my profile. And it works really, really well for me because it gives me a clue as to whether my profile is actually being received well and attracting the type of people I want to look at my profile. So this Ray Doyle, he's a guy I met today at a, a lunch of Amchat. And I like Ray. I know Ray. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, a good Irishman. So I wrote in my connection request. Would you like to connect? To be sure, to be sure. So I just personalised it a little bit. And um, this guy, I don't know where he's from, but Kylie is based up in Brisbane and she helps people with their LinkedIn profiles. And I thought, okay, well, if she's looked at mine, I might as well invite her to connect with me. And she did. And, um, you know, because the LinkedIn algorithm loves it if you're connected to people who are in the same area. So, um, yeah, and I'm happy to share what I know. So, yeah, a quick win and, and I found her by reverse stalking. So it can be a really good way to, to reach out to people. Oh, so you looked at my profile, you're interested in joining Rotary. Um, you could perhaps do even. And a couple of people have looked at me anonymously. Now, mm -hmm. the number one activity, not by me, but by everybody else on LinkedIn, is at about this time every night, about nine o'clock, people like to look at people's profiles. Now, if you would like to anonymously stalk people, you can do it. And uh, you click on this little picture on the top right-hand side and click on Privacy and Settings. 
And here in the middle of the screen, there's a privacy button. And in this profile viewing options, you can actually see that I've got my name there. I've got this one in the middle, or I can go anonymous. So if I go anonymous, even if uh, the other person's got a premium account, they will not know when I've looked at their profile. Mm, um, good. If you're wanting to do, you know, you've got a job interview tomorrow and you want to check out the interviewer, you could go in here and turn yourself anonymous and then look at their profile, then come back and turn yourself on. And I do encourage you to leave yourself turned on because otherwise you can't see the last five people who've looked at your profile. So definitely worth keeping yourself turned on most of the time. There's a couple of other settings that are important in here as well. If you are in your own practice, the last thing you want to do is have someone look at your profile and then see all the other people who specialise in the same thing. So this is one I've turned off. Although I'm happy to connect to other LinkedIn people and other people who do similar kind of stuff, I don't actually want to promote them on my page. So I've, I've turned that one to no one. The other thing that I like to do is encourage people to think about who can see your connections. So if somebody's in a sales role or a very senior CEO, they don't necessarily want everybody to know who they're connected to. So what they can do is they can change this setting to only you. And if, if I'm connected to Bill and he's connected to Mary and we have this setting on only you, if I look at Bill's profile, I'll see that we're both connected to Mary, but I won't see any of his other connections if I have only you. But my purpose is slightly different. I run networks and I do lots of training and I'm quite happy to, to let people know who else knows me. So I've left mine turned on to your connections. So that's another option there. Um, any questions? No. No, all right. We'll keep going. So that was the first thing from the home screen. Uh, click on there and write down the number of views you've had in the last 90 days. I do actually encourage you to write it down because you will forget and you can't sort of ever trace that number again at a later date. The second thing I do before I work with anybody is we go to the profile screen. And you can do this on anybody's profile you like. And what you can do is you can choose save to PDF. So that means you can save everything that you've written on your LinkedIn profile to a PDF document. So if one day you, you know, LinkedIn goes poof and it's gone, then what you can do is obviously reproduce your profile based on what was in the PDF document. And also, if you want to print it out, you can do that. If you want to send it to someone, you can do that. If you want to look at somebody else's profile, save it to PDF, print it out and borrow some ideas, you can do that as well. So I've gone into Google Chrome and changed my settings. I go down to advanced settings and I've made sure that this box is ticked. Ask where to save my files before downloading. So what happens is when I choose save to PDF, it asks me where I would like to save this on my, my computer. So if I thought I'll save it on my USB disk, what I normally do here is I write today's date back to front at the beginning so that I know on the 4th of May, this is what my LinkedIn profile looked like and leave it as PDF and I can save it and then I've got a backup copy on my USB stick or wherever you want to put it on your computer. So, so that's mm. a really thing. The third thing that I encourage you to do is export all your connections. So this is under my network connections. And then there's this cog on the right hand side. And when you click through to that screen, it usually tells you how many connections you've got, but sometimes it shows on the screen and sometimes it doesn't. And so tonight it's not showing. And then we choose this export LinkedIn connections. And regardless of whether you've got a PC or a Mac or whatever, you always leave it as Microsoft Outlook CSV file. And you choose export. Type in the security code. And then I'll save it on my USB stick. And I'll put today's code again back to front at the beginning. Now, if I open this file,
It will open in Excel. Don't try and open it any other way because <laughs> you'll just get gobbledygook on your screen. And you can see here we've got first name, last name, email address, as well as current job, sorry, current company and current job title for mm. all of my connections. And so if I go to the end of this list, I'll be able to see how many connections I've got. Eight thousand two hundred and seventeen. So that's another good way to keep a record of your, your stats and how many connections you've got. And if you ever go in and can't see who you're connected to, then if you've exported that list, you can still, you know, have a look and you can get your email address. You can use it as a prospecting list, especially if you're a thermomix person. You might want to be ringing them all up. It's an obviously not got their email, uh, their phone number. <laughs> Uh, you can at least get um, the details and, and you know, have some sort of system match it up to your own company database, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, there are three things I recommend. So if you'd like to update your own profile, there's a few things that I like to encourage you to consider doing. So we'll just there, profile. And the first thing I recommend is your own URL. So if you put your cursor next to your name here, if it says PV slash letters, numbers, a whole bunch of gobbledygook, you press that little settings button and then it will enable you over here to customise your URL and put one word lowercase um, and try and let you put that in there for yourself. Now, if your name is John Smith, you know, there's going to be heaps of other John Smiths and you're going to have to put numbers or something else as well. Um, but mine's available, so I've kept that. If I change it to something else, Sue Elson author, and then I want to go back to being just Sue Elson, it won't let me do that. So, you know, once you've chosen it, it's probably a pretty good idea to, to keep it. <coughs> of course, that whole URL there is what you'd put on the Rotary eClub website or on your email signature, whatever. But it's much nicer if you personalise it. You can also put it on your business card. Um, any proposals that you write, you know, it's a really handy thing to, to have a nice, clean, custom URL. Okay, so back to the profile. Um, the most important section of your profile, if you want to be found in search results, is your headline, which is this little spot here, directly underneath your name. And you've got 120 characters there. And you can see mine's full of lots of keywords that I think people might try and find me under. So, so that's how I've written it. That's the number one spot. If, you, if you're a, a hairdresser and a hairstylist and blah, 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 you'd put all those words in there to make sure that you can be found you know, on LinkedIn. Um, I also have a photo and you're 14 times more likely to be viewed if you've got a photo. And it's really important that it's a photo that reflects your purpose. So I'm trying to look obviously professional and reliable and friendly and all that kind of thing in this photo. But um, if you looked at Linda's, I mean, she's got sunglasses on and she looks all creative because she's an artist. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a corporate standard looking thing like this, but it does need to match what your purpose is. The eyes need to be the focus, you know, not some big green earring hanging off my ear. Um, and also your eyes in the middle of the shot and uh, also to make sure there's a natural conclusion at the bottom here, too much skin and a plunging neckline, or a hairy chest, which I had one eye. <laughs> he had to Photoshop his, uh, the top of his shirt because he had hair sticking out of it. So, um, yeah, you want to make sure that's nice and neat and tight. Now, in the contact info box here, you can put three websites. So I'm going to suggest if you guys are willing, you could uh, choose other and you could put Rotary E-Club of Melbourne and the Rotary E-Club of Melbourne website there. And that gives another link to Rotary E-Club of Melbourne um, out there in the online world. So that would be really advantageous. Um, but if you're wanting to maximise your own, you can see here I've popped my Sue Elson one on, my other website, Newcomers Network, and my publishing one. If I was, like, maybe for instance, a accountant, I could put CPA Australia if I was a member of that. You know, the three most important websites related to you, really important to pop in there. As well as your Skype, you know, if people might be wanting to have a video call with you, um, your mobile phone number written in that international format, you know, fill in as much as you can on your LinkedIn profile. But when you are doing these updates, 
um, please make sure you've got this notify your network turned off because you know everybody doesn't need to, to be notified every time you change something in your profile. Now most of you will have on your screen these coloured little boxes here and you'll also have another little link that says view more and they're all the sections that you can display on your LinkedIn profile. So I've only got two missing. Um, I was actually thinking of getting a patent just so I could get rid of this box, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it. Um, and the other one I don't recommend that you complete is your personal details, which is your date of birth, which I'm an ex-banker, so there's no way I'm giving away my date of birth. I use the 1st of January of the year I was born, if I have to put it on something. And um, my marital status, which again, has got nothing to do with my ability to do the job, so I leave that off. But there's heaps of sections that you complete, you know, experience, education, certifications, you know, whole bunches of them. You can see here that I've also written some posts on LinkedIn. In fact, I've actually written quite a lot of posts on LinkedIn, and these are really good for, for increasing my brand. This one here, I mean, you tell me where else I can write an article and get 12,000 people looking at it, you know? Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. So, so that's why I like writing posts. Um, I can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, also, the summary. So the photo, headline, and then your summary would be here. They're the three most important things that people will look at. So you can see here that I've got my email address with a space around it so that the spam robots don't see it and my mobile phone number, and then exactly what I do. And because I've got my really clear message there, most people who ring me I say, I'd like to book you for an appointment. You know, they're not saying, how much do you charge? What do you do? You know, all that kind of stuff. Because my message is really, really clear, um, it leads people straight to exactly what I want them to do. It's working really well for me. I've also got, as I said, text links, which will be clickable on a mobile. And I've also got a brief bio, so if I'm going to be introduced for anything, that the brief bio is there. But, you know, if, you, if you're looking for something in particular or you want to recruit people to Rotary or you, you want to talk about Rotary projects, you've got 2,000 characters there you can put in something with. And that specialty box isn't available anymore. It's an old feature. I've also got a bit of bling here. That's a video, um, some images, um, just to make it look like I know what I'm doing. And I've also got my... Um, you know, my current job and I've got the job description and keywords after it and then obviously my company is linked there so you can see the, um, the logo there and then a bit of a description about it. So I'll show you one that's a little bit more normal. I teach the CAE here in Melbourne. So first of all, I include a little bit of a description about the CAE, then I talk about my tasks, achievements, and my contact details there. So this is what I recommend that you do for all of your past jobs, um, because that's how most people like to understand what you did, and it really helps with, um, you know, there's lots of keywords in there that people can find what you're on about. Any questions? No. I want to know how you add the lovely background pictures to the top of your profile. Oh, that's easy. Um, you just put your cursor here and click edit background. Oh, yeah. Terrific. And that's, that's really easy. And the same with your photo. You can change that as well. So after experience, uh, there's one other thing, a couple of things I'll show you. This is my voluntary role with Ari. So, you know, I was a convener and a counsellor and and so on. So I've actually put that in my professional section. Um, there's another really good one here for anybody who's had gaps in their career. So I moved from Adelaide to Melbourne in 1994. So from then and for another six years, 11 months, I did part-time study, part-time work, both voluntary and paid uh, for all of that time. But I, I wasn't, it wasn't consecutive. You know, there were quite a number of months or weeks where I wasn't working. So rather than have big gaps on my resume or my summary, um, what I've done is I've grouped them all together. So if you're trying to combine work and family, that's a really good way to do that. It's not lying, but it is sort of massaging the message. <laughs> mm. And also you can see, unlike some people, I don't care how old I am. If you don't want to hire me because of my age, I figure, well, we're not going to work together anyway, so I don't worry about that. But my first job started six days after my last year 12 exam, 
and I did a lot of different roles in the bank over 11 years and three months, but I haven't put them all as individual jobs on LinkedIn because, you know, it's just too old in terms of But I have still included that job that I did at Westpac. And one of my keywords is training, and of course that's in that little description there as well. So that helps. Um, then, because I'm a professional member of associations, I've put them there because they've got company profiles, the logo comes up. It's not about being a certified electrician or something. Um, if you've got professional membership, you can put that in there. You can put the Rotary Club of Melbourne in there. Um, some publications, you can add those. Languages, you know. I only did French at school for five years, but I've still put it on. <laughs> New projects. Uh, volunteers, so this is my voluntary roles that I've done. Organisations I support, you can put Rotary Club in there as well. Your skills, you can sort into the order you want. So say I wanted to put marketing in a different spot, um, you know, I, or networking, I just click and drag and, you know, they can move wherever. Um, and education, this is a really important one, particularly if you know young people. Um, I've described the university and all my subjects because they're fantastic keywords. Many people don't put their subjects in. You don't have to put your grades, but all your subjects are really valuable in terms of um, optimising your LinkedIn profile. And then past that, I've got my interests and I've got my keywords in again there. And lastly, advice for contacting me. And again, I include my details so that people can reach me quite easily. Yeah. No, fire away. Let me have any of your other questions about LinkedIn. Um, I had a question regarding um, the purpose or why people would endorse you for skills. Is it to really, because uh, I've had quite a few people endorsing me for skills that they have no idea whether I actually have or not. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a lawyer and they might be, you know, a, a, um, a Rotarian quite often um, and they're endorsing me for, you know, contract drafting, for instance. Yes. Um, wh why, what, what, is that the purpose, is to more just have activity on their own profile or? Yeah. Look, what happened when endorsements first became available for skills, which is, you know, that section where we were looking before you can shuffle around, what I think LinkedIn were trying to do was just trying to encourage a little bit more engagement. And everybody was getting very annoyed about the whole process because a lot of them were fake endorsements. Like there's a group of yeah. engineering students who all endorse each other for engineering, but they're only students, <laughs> you know. So yeah. a few of the HR managers say that's a waste of time. The way I look at it is if you have 100 endorsements for something more, Let's assume that at least 30% were accurate, therefore you must be a lawyer, you know. So that's the way I see it. But in terms of a LinkedIn strategy, as in do you want to maximise LinkedIn, if you're seen to be endorsing other people, LinkedIn then pops your name in front of other people you're connected to and says, oh, does Sue know about LinkedIn, you know, and encourages them to vote for you. So, so it triggers off sort of the good behaviour reward kind of thing. But also, if I'm a lawyer and I endorse you for law and somebody looks at who's recommended me for law, then they might say, oh, there's another lawyer and I'll check that out. So, you know, they could be that sort of one. But I would suggest if you really want to be seen on other people's profiles, the best way to do it is to write them a recommendation. So if we go further up here, so Max Berry has written a recommendation for me. So, you know, and Alan Briggs. So every time somebody looks at my profile, Alan and Max are getting free PR. And so if you want to go about it, you can do that. And to get to the recommendations page, you just type in linkedin.com slash RECS. And that will show you the recommendations you've received, the ones you've given. It gives you a, an option to ask or give them as well. I suggest if you want people to write recommendations for you, that you reach out to them personally and say, you know, hi, Belinda, you know, I really love your work at Rotary. Um, I'd love to write a recommendation for you. What would you like me to focus on in the recommendation? Because, oh, well, you know how I brought in new members and, you know, worked on these six projects, whatever. 
And I might know you and think, well, she said she brought in loads of members, but she didn't really. I, I mean, I'm making all this up, by the way. I, I'm not saying <laughs> And uh, so I'll say, well, look, you know, uh, I saw Melinda through her projects at Rotary. You know, she managed to get lots of support for the projects and this and that happened. And <laughs> regularly promotes um, Rotary membership. I wouldn't say she increased it by 64% because, you know, that's not true. Uh, so what you write in a recommendation, you do need to be a little bit careful because it's used in a court of law. But, um, you know, provided you feel comfortable with whatever you've written, it's good. And then now that I've written Belinda a, a recommendation, Belinda will hopefully say, well, Sue, would you like me to write a recommendation for you? And, you know, that's a little bit nicer than saying, you know, will you do one for me first? Um, um, yeah, that's the way I like to do it. And I just like to check what they'd like me to focus on in the recommendation. Hmm. Nice. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh. <clears throat> Is everyone on LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I, I no, I don't have any questions. I did. I did send a, uh, a, a sent a chat message to Sue before. I just said, Sue, what scout group were you in? And you mentioned you mentioned sailing. Yes, yeah, I was involved in the Morty Alex Sailing Club, and when I went to the Jamboree up in Sydney, um, I was on the sailing team, the water team, and uh, took kids out on boats for two weeks, and I'm the only person on that team that didn't capsize. And I told them they should buy a beer, and they wouldn't. I thought that was pretty lousy. And the excuse they gave was because there was one particular boat I didn't take the kids out of, and I didn't because the other boat that was like it, the mast broke. So I thought, there's no way in heck I'm going to take kids out on a boat where the mast might break. Um, so, yeah, that was a lot of fun um, and I did that. I was involved in a couple of different scout groups, but I think it was First Lower Templestowe was the main one. That I was the most you know, the, way, the, the reason, the reason I, the reason I uh, raised the question is that uh, many, many, many years ago, I was a member of First Victorian Sea Scouts, and uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, we we were uh, obviously Sea Scouts. We we did a lot of sailing, and uh, yes. yes, I was uh, I was uh, went to the 1956 Jamboree, which was called the Mud Barrier, uh, and yeah, so yeah, that's how long ago I was interested in sailing <laughs> and in Scouts. Yes, yeah, it was really fascinating. The boats that they had that Jamboree was shocking. And I kid you not, they were held together with duct tape. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I thought, well, and, and it was really interesting. I was quite shocked at the number of kids who were very overweight. And, of course, I'm just a woman. I don't have, you know, strong muscles. And so I was to take these kids sailing. And it was really difficult because they were so heavy, they didn't have any flexibility. And as you would know with sailing, weight is a significant you know, impact when you're, you're out on a boat, particularly in a bay where the variable weather conditions are. So if you tell these kids to lean to the left, they'd move their head sideways, you know. The actual amount of displacement is, I don't know, 100 grams. So I actually had to tell them, you know, bottom left and bottom right and, and this kind of thing. And, but most of the kids had no experience and a couple of them did. And I let them take the helm and, and I got back to shore and the guys were all like, oh, you shouldn't have let them sail. I said, no, they've got experience. Why can't I? Um, but, yeah, it was pretty tricky conditions. We had a ferry coming in. We had canoes and kayaks. We had the, the wind would change 360 degrees in five minutes, you know, and I'm on a boat with a bunch of kids who don't know how to sail. It was quite a challenge. But Thanks, Sue. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Do we have any other questions? I, I'd just like to, uh, if, if, I, if I may, Belinda, through you, uh, just that, uh, Sue, I, I think uh, LinkedIn is uh, a tremendous uh, uh, for, for younger people. Mm -hmm. For us, uh, 70 plus that have retired, uh, uh, okay, apart from the rotary, uh, apart from the rotary angle, yeah, there's, there's, there's not much uh, that I do to sort of uh, try and uh, sell myself as. No, but what is important is if somebody's trying to find you for whatever reason and they Google you, 
um, it means that people can reach out to you. So I say for a lot of people, you know, put your number on there. There's a lot of people who do family history and want to reconnect with school friends and organise reunions and all that kind of stuff. And so if you want to be open to those kinds of opportunities, really good, you know, to have your details on LinkedIn. Have you had much... Um um sort of connection with other rotary clubs and and are they using linkedin as a way of promoting their projects yeah um the first presentation i did after i wrote the book was for the rotary club of hawthorne and they're using it quite actively they're putting the linkedin urls of their speakers on some of their social media um started putting up updates and videos on their page um, I'm going to be going off to the Rotary Club of Glen Ira, and I believe they're a little bit more active. Oh. 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 But yeah, see here, you can see, well, they've only got, they've got 33 followers. That's happened in a month. And yeah. um, they've obviously, well, they've got one like there. But yeah, you can see their profiling speakers and stuff like that. There's my book. Oh. And I've responded. There's quite a few people who like that. And yeah, so they've started using it. Hmm. Mm. Okay. Good. Well, that's good. That's a good example that we can. Um... Um, can someone please mute? Yeah, I'm trying. Hang on. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I'm starting to get it. I, I, I don't know whether my batteries are going flat, but I'm starting to hear a lot of background noise. I might say, uh, thank you, Sue, uh, and I'll uh, say I've got to go now uh, and I'll leave the meeting over to you, Belinda. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we will, um, we'll stop there. Um, Sue, thank you very much. Thank you for, um, for everything that you've shown us about. There's a lot there. There's a lot to take in. And I, I mean, I'm not using LinkedIn anywhere near to its potential at this stage but um but it's opened my eyes to a lot of things that i could be doing and um and i can see how this could be um uh, something that our club could use anyway to to with like you said with the guest speakers and mm -hmm. promoting projects so i think that that's um something that we can investigate a little bit more and um thank you for your very comprehensive discussion about that so thank you yeah, you're most welcome I, I might just quickly add before you go that yeah you're an e-club so if people are interested in an e-club they're going to want to know what you do socially you know and online and if yeah. they're thinking about it you know thank goodness i don't have to go to a meeting i don't have to travel i don't have to eat the lunch you know etc cetera, etc cetera, they're, they're really going to be doing their own due diligence so if you've got this sort of content online I think it would help you enormously, you know, recruiting new people because they're going to look at that story and say, yeah, you know, they don't just meet virtually and just do everything the same way. They're actually doing something socially. And I was at this lunch today where the, the managing director of Twitter was there and she said that, you know, when the CEO of a large organisation puts out a tweet on their own account, they've actually been able to match it to an increase in the stock value of the organisation. So as leaders, it's really, really important that you get your message out in these sorts of platforms because they're, they're quite powerful. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's nice great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now you are... Oh, thank you.